So there are five main things we did to improve the performance of our game Soul Stalker so that we can get the game running on Switch, PlayStation, and Xbox. And these tips are not just for CPU and GPU, which I think is what most people are covering when they make these kind of videos, but they also apply to RAM and loading. So these tips work for all engines, so the video really applies to anybody who wants to port their game to Switch or maybe even mobile, this also applies to that. But if you're not a game developer and you just wanna see what it takes to get a game to be multi-platform, then this video is also for you. So the optimization that you can apply to your game, which is relevant to tons of genres, is called pooling. And basically, in most game engines, whenever you instantiate something at runtime, so what that means is whenever you spawn something in the middle of the game, that actually has a lot of performance impact, and the same goes for when you're destroying something in the game. And so that sounds like a pretty big issue, right? So many games spawn so many things like damage numbers, enemies, visual effects, you can go on forever. But the solution to this is actually you can pre-create all of the objects that you need before you need them. Like for example, in Soulstalker, here are some of the things that we pooled. We did enemies, coins, damage numbers, explosion visual effects, I can go on forever as I said, um, but those are the core things that really had a large performance impact whenever we were spawning things in the game. And so in Soulstalker, at the start of each combat, there's like a little fade, right? So it's kind of like a small loading screen. And so what we do during this fade is we pre-create all of the objects that we need and we set them as active whenever we need them, but they're not active until we actually need them. And then there's another step that you can do, which is to give each of these things that you're creating a function or a way to reset all of the variables. So just to give you an example, when you activate an enemy for the first time, it will have a certain health value, right? It's the default health value. Um, but then when you defeat it, the health goes to zero. So what do you do? Next time you're gonna instantiate it, it's gonna be zero again. So you need to find a way to just reset all the variables so you can reuse that enemy. It's almost like recycling objects. So it's definitely a big pain to set up if you already made your game with certain assumptions in place, but it's super worth it, especially for Switch and especially if you're spawning tons of things like we are doing in Soulstalker. Because of the genre that the game is in, we're just spawning so many projectiles and so many enemies all the time the pooling was really, really necessary, but for something like maybe a turn-based RPG, it might not be so necessary. So very often people talk about CPU and GPU optimization because they're usually the most relevant, right? But this tip here is all about RAM. And it's actually a huge part of optimizing games for Switch, which actually only has four gigabytes of RAM. Uh, but actually the four gigabyte figure is a bit misleading because it's not all available for you to use as a game developer. Some of that actually has to go into the operating system and you can imagine how something like the recording feature on Switch uses some of that. And so all in all, you actually only have probably around 3.2 gigabytes available to you to use for your game. So now that I've given you a bit of the preamble, what is this RAM optimization that we made for Soulstalker for Switch? And actually it has all to do with UI and the game being in dock mode. So this issue only happened in dock mode. It was really, really weird. Well, the way that I had set up the game's menus before starting the porting process was that whenever a menu wasn't in use, it was just faded out, right? It wasn't deactivated, it was faded out. And in Unity, there's a component called the canvas group and that's how we faded everything out. We just set the transparency to zero. Uh, but the benefit of this is that actually it has no performance impact really, or has a bit, but not that much uh, when you just set it to zero and then it's really easy to just fade everything out and in uh, and you don't get any deactivation activation issue. So that's why I decided to do that. Uh, but there was one key issue that happened, and that was that even though the engine wasn't doing any CPU or GPU calculations when the UI was deactivated, any of the text that was under this canvas group was still stored in RAM. And so again, usually this wasn't a big deal because there aren't that many characters in the Latin alphabet, so the RAM usage was quite minimal. But then everything changed when we localized the game to Japanese and to Chinese. The problem was that some languages, like Japanese for example, have way, way more characters than English. Not only do you have the two phonetic alphabets, but you also have the kanji characters, for which there are thousands. So the text that was stored in these text components, even if they weren't rendered, they have a certain memory usage, which is so much more when the text is in Japanese. But actually, the game worked perfectly fine whenever we switched the game to Japanese on Switch. It wasn't just that that was the issue. The real problem came when we actually set the game to Japanese in handheld mode and then put it on the dock. That was the only time the game crashed because of memory, so what was going on? Well, the way that Unity handles fonts made it such that whenever we increase the game's resolution when putting the game in docked mode from handheld mode, all the font textures had to be recalculated and so much of that was being held in memory at the time that it just tipped it over the edge. So how do you fix this? Well, instead of just fading out the text how I used to do it, 
you just deactivate them and then all the text that is in Japanese is not being stored in memory and then you don't have the issue that I ran into. There was one point early on in the porting process where I was testing out Soulstalker and I noticed that some levels just didn't perform as well as the others on the CPU side and I thought that was really weird because they all kind of look similar in terms of how much foliage and decoration they have. So I've been super lucky that Tim has been helping us with the ports because he just went in, profiled everything and noticed that everything was because of the terrain system. And that actually made a lot of sense because some levels use the terrain and others don't. And it just so happened that that matched perfectly with the levels that performed worse than the others. And so the solution was pretty simple and that was to still use the terrain system for making all the levels. But then I used this package to convert my terrain into a regular 3D object that was super optimized with all the parameters that the package gives you. So if you're using another engine like Godot or like Unreal, then consider something like this uh, if it exists for you. At one point, we realized that the game was stuttering quite a bit on opening some menus, and then looking into it, it was because each of these little buttons were instantiated for every single weapon and trinket when you open the menu. So given that there are like over a hundred of these total, it made sense why instantiating all of these over one frame would cause a stutter. So what we could have done to fix this is just instantiate them on starting the game, kind of similar to how the pooling worked. But in order to keep things simple and change as little code as possible, because we did figure this out quite late in development, um, what we did was just instantiate a certain amount of buttons each frame. So the number that we actually landed on was five. So we only instantiate five buttons every frame whenever you open the menu. That worked out perfectly, but that's exactly how many buttons there are in the first page of the menu. So you never actually even notice anything and the performance is just flat out better. Because there are 85 buttons max instantiated on opening one of these menus, the maximum amount of time it will take to instantiate all of these buttons, five buttons at a time, will be 17 frames. And that's just not enough to notice anything, especially because most of those are done out of the field of view of your menu. And there are many different ways of doing this depending on your engine, but in Unity, how we did it was we used a coroutine and here's the piece of code that you can see uh, for how we did it. And you can copy it if you want, or maybe apply it to your engine with whatever feature that they have to do the same thing. So it's quite simple and this is a very effective way of cutting down on loading or on stutters if you don't want to restructure everything with pooling and if you don't need to. And now most of this video has kind of focused on lower end hardware like Switch, but there was one issue that was actually completely destroying our PlayStation and Xbox performance and it was actually related to achievements. Basically, some achievements in Soulstalker are related to incremental stats, like defeating 100 enemies or dashing 150 times. And the main issue that I'm talking about related to the achievement of how many enemies you had defeated. You might be wondering, how does that achievement hurt performance? It just seems pretty standard. Uh, well, what was happening is that every single time you defeated one enemy, the game tried to update your stats and communicate with the Xbox and PlayStation servers to make that known. The problem was that because of the genre, you defeat so many enemies so quickly and it was just way too frequent. It was communicating with the servers way too frequently. The fix to this was quite simple. And what we ended up doing was keeping a counter in the game for these stats that was not connected at all to the servers. And then whenever you finish the combat, for example, it communicated the stats that you had in the game. So these five optimizations were really the thing that made the game be able to run on Switch, PlayStation, and Xbox. But there are quite a few things that I haven't covered in this video that I either did or I would have liked to do uh, if I had more time or for a sequel maybe. Um, so if you'd like to see those, uh, let me know. But for now, if you want to support my games, then the game is coming out on Xbox, Switch, and PlayStation on October 24th. There's going to be a launch discount, so please uh, go to the links in the descriptions, uh, wishlist those, or get the game on Steam. You can already do that right now. It's in early access. And the final build is actually live now on a beta branch, so you can check that out. And also subscribe if you want to see more videos on how I bring my games to console with Tim. Tim has been such a great help, so follow him on Twitter as well. The link is in the description. Um, but yeah, we're going to have two more games coming to Switch, PlayStation and Xbox in the next six months or so. So uh, subscribe for that and uh, see you next time. Bye.